Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa DeSisto. I'm the publisher of the Port. Um, what am I? Oh yeah, I'm the, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm the publisher of the Portland Press Herald. And thank you, thank you that I got that out. Thank you. I am so happy you could join us tonight for a sellout of Maine Voices Live. We are so excited to have Chase Morrill here, and I'm sure we have some fans of Maine Cabin Masters. Am I right? <laughs> So um, before I get started, I just wanted to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, H.M. Payson, AAA Travel, Celebrity Cruises, Stroud Water Lodge, Hancock Lumber, and I'd also like to thank our in-kind sponsors, the Weston Hotel Hub Furniture, where you can find these attractive uh, seats and uh, also Portland Downtown. Without our sponsors, we couldn't bring you the fantastic journalism we bring you every day in the Portland Press Herald, nor would we bring you this series. So we thank them very much. So let me tell you a little bit about Chase, although it seems like you um, main cabin masters groupies already know everything about him. So maybe you should be up here and doing this. But um, as you know, he's the star of main cabin masters on the DIY network. The reality show follows the Kennebec property services crew, which includes, and I see some of them here. Hopefully you'll have a chance to meet them later on. Um, Chase's sister, Ashley, her husband, Ryan, and longtime friends, Dixie and Jedi, as they gut rehab, rebuild, and redecorate main camps and cabins. Chase is a 10th generation Mainer. Now, I hope we can thank his ancestors for separating us from Massachusetts. <laughs> so hopefully we can ask him uh, a little bit about that, says this girl who grew up in Massachusetts. But anyway, um, so he and his crew work with tight budgets and time frames while the producers capture up to 40 hours of footage for each episode. The show is currently in its second successful season. Tonight, Chase will be interviewed by Maine journalism master, Eric Russell, and uh, he's a general assignment reporter for the Press Herald and the Maine Sunday tele Telegram. Um, Eric's work, you'll see a day in and day out in the Press Herald, but I think some of his best work has been for some of the special newsroom projects that we have produced, including Lost, the series that we did last year on heroin's grip on Maine's people, and a wonderful piece that Eric did that was part of our series on aging in Maine where he introduced you to Larry Roy, who um, lovingly takes care of his wife with Alzheimer's. So Eric's work is just fantastic, and we're delighted that they could be here together tonight. Eric grew up in Westbrook, went to UMaine, worked at the BDN for a bunch of years, and now are, we are delighted to have him um, at the Press Herald, where he's been since 2012. So with that, meet Chase Morrill and Eric Russell. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody for coming out. Um, this is probably what beard envy feels like. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all have it. <laughs> is it a requirement of the show that you have a beard? I mean, it's a requirement of Maine working outside, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to get to the show, um, but I want to get a little bit of your background. Uh, they mentioned that you're a 10th generation Mainer. I don't know who in your family did the, uh, the legwork on that, but. Um, talk a little bit about growing up, where you grew up, and then a little bit about um, your first experience with, with cabins or camps, which I think is a very sort of main thing and why we're here. Sure. So we have a very large family tree, 10 generations maybe, maybe not, but... We'll fact check that. Right, 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 right. There's some family members who might be able to uh, back that up. <laughs> so yeah, I grew up in Augusta. Um, we all grew up in the Augusta Gardner area. Um, we all, you know, love Maine. We want to be here. And, you know, we all have that camp that our friend has a camp, family has a camp. And, you know, it's just a place where you can go and really enjoy Maine, whether it's summertime or in the cold in the wintertime. But we definitely uh, want to be here. And we... Um, I'm at a blank right now. Talk to me a little. Talk to me a bit, a little bit about how you got into this line of work. Is it something that you always wanted to do? Is it something you stumbled into? So it's something 
most of all of us grew up doing. My grandfather was a civil engineer, but you know he worked on his own places. My father, you know, was a builder. I, you know, I grew up hammering my hand, following him around. Um, I went to College Atlantic. You know, I've got a human ecology degree. Ryan has a English major degree. <laughs> you know, Dixie's got ski industry, ski industry degree. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really a degree? <laughs> but you know, you're in Maine, you do what you, you know, you do what you can, and it kind of, we all kind of just circled back to building. Um, we were all kind of doing our own thing. I was working in Wayne, you know, doing handyman stuff with my father. Ryan, Jedi, and Dixie were kind of doing their thing. And then we all got together and we're working on this timber frame in Wayne. And that's kind of when the whole idea began. You know, I showed up one day, I was like, hey, you guys want to be on TV? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, sure, Chase, whatever. So, you know, you're doing this thing, you're building, you're rehabbing cabins, and you're like, what the hell? Let's let people film that? Yeah, so we were doing this timber frame, and my daughter's friend's mother... Got that? <laughs> ...works for Kennebec Land Trust. She knew the production company, Dorsey Pictures, which is out of Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. She knew that they were looking for carpenters, or to do a show about carpenters in Maine that specialize in fixing up old camps and you know, try and salvage and reuse as much material as possible. Put us together, you know, I sent him an email, I'm like, is this for real? And they're like, yes. <laughs> and so we did some Skype interviews and I think they just you know, saw that there was something there because we're all family, we're all friends. You know, we have, the they like the beards. <laughs> So we did that, and we did a pilot, and you know they liked it enough that they're like, let's do a whole season. Yeah. I think people who watch shows like this and reality shows in general, they want to know how authentic is it, right? How much of what they're seeing um, <laughs> is authentic? And maybe you, can, maybe you can illuminate us on that. I mean, what we say, I mean, we say what we say. How much do they have to clean it up? Some of us more than others. <laughs> Depends on the timeline of the project. You know, when it's the night before the reveal. The stress gets to you. The stress gets to you. You know, things are said, feelings are hurt. But, you know, at the end we all, you know, complete the project and on to the next. When we talked before, um, you know, you said you guys would be doing this whether there were cameras following you around or not. But I want to talk about a little bit about, you know, there are producers Oh, and they have certain, you know, demands, storytelling demands, and I wonder how much of that uh, conflicts with, with what you're doing or whether you have to sort of say, all right, I guess we'll do that, or they just kind of <laughs> let you do your thing and, and deal with it at the end. So, it's, I mean, it's definitely a balance. Yeah. You know, when they first showed up season one, you know, they had all these expectations, all these demands, but ultimately our responsibility is to the camp owner. You know, I mean, they are putting up the money, you know, we're working to them. If they're not happy with what they have, you know, our name's on the line and we want to make sure, you know, we have to stay in Maine and keep working with people in Maine. So it, it was tough. But Your reputation lasts beyond the show. Like absolutely, that. absolutely. But, you know, but then we do some fun things that were like, all right, let's give them, throw them a bone. You know, like <laughs> pulling the porch off with a boat. No, we probably <laughs> wouldn't do that normally. <laughs> Why not? Just so everybody knows. <laughs> you know, what's it like to sort of, I assume that you do, but what's it like to watch a finished product of a show? You know, you know you're working on this project for six weeks, eight weeks, and they're shooting all this footage, and who knows what the heck they're going to use, right? And then you see the finished product of the show. Is it, is it strange? Has it gotten easier to watch yourself uh, on TV? It's definitely gotten easier to watch, us, at least for me. Um, but season one, they could have gone any direction with this show, and luckily they're, you know, a great group of people, and they got it. You know, like they could see what we were doing. We were having fun, with what we were doing. They could see the beauty of where we were working, and so they're like, okay, you know, let's take it this way. But it's, you know, still weird sometimes seeing myself. Well, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, 
the, some of the shots of Maine and the different places that you go, I mean, people that live in Maine, they're like, oh yeah, I recognize that, or that's very uniquely Maine, right? Uh, I wonder how people who are not from Maine or people who watch the show in other parts of the country, you know, if they're seeing this for the first time or they're saying, oh geez, is that, is that what Maine's really like? I don't know if you, you get some feedback from people that watch it that aren't Mainers or aren't 10th generation Mainers or whatever. Oh, all the time. And you what know, do they say? They're, it's all positive. You know, like, oh, we love, we love Maine. You know, we're going to come visit this summer because of the show. Like, we never knew. But then we also get the people who, the viewers who have a connection to Maine. Mm. Like, oh, when I was little, we used to go to a camp out on Cobsey, you know. Right. And they just have that connection. I think that's a big draw of the show. It's like, you know, Maine, it's vacation land. So people come here to vacation. We're lucky enough to live here. But it is, it's a beautiful state, it's great, and yeah. And it's clearly a place that people like to want to set reality shows. I mean, this is clearly not the, the first uh, show that's been set in Maine. And I, I wonder, you know, we talked about the beards and whether that's a requirement or not, but do you ever feel like pressure to uh, play up the Maine? And, and then, do you worry about stereotyping this lovely state that we all live in? <laughs> I mean, we try not to play up the stereotype, <laughs> but you know, when we all get together, we're hanging out, it's just easy to slip back into that comfortable <laughs> mode and, you know, ours start getting dropped and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's natural, but for the most part, again, we've been shown in a positive light, so. I'm going to, sorry for the interruption. We can't fix the problem with the lavalier mics, and I'm sure everybody's tired of the fingernails on chalkboard going on. So we're going to have you guys hold these. Don't those? We'll take care of those. We'll turn them off. But, okay. So use the handhelds. Okay. And everybody will be happy. Yes. <laughs> is this karaoke? Because <laughs> if it is, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, thanks for your patience on that. Um, you know, this idea of a, of a <laughs> That was you, right? That was yours. Uh, <laughs> I saw it. Shut your mic off. It's off. This idea of, uh, you know, cabins in Maine, um, it's a very family thing. You know, you and I talked a little bit th about this backstage. It's a very sort of like generational thing, not necessarily 10 generations, but, you know, families, families pass down cabins. They spend time at cabins. It's there's a lot of memories tied up in it. And I wonder, you know, as you're being asked to renovate these cabins that, you know, are often in, in people's families for generations, how much are you sort of thinking about preserving what's already in there mm -hmm. and, and improving on what they, uh, what they have? I think that's a priority. You know, like we go into these camps and we almost, look, you know, we take a holistic look at it and say, okay, what are the needs of this family? How are they going to grow? How can we make it so this camp is used more and more functional for the family? But, you know, we go in and there's so much history that we don't want to... I think we, we tread lightly to make sure we don't ruin any of those memories. We just try and improve upon them. But, it, I mean, there's a, there's a serious level of trust there because we meet the camp owners, you know, they send in their application, they have a list of, you know, their wish list. Say, okay, we'd love this, this, this. We're a family of four with two little kids and we want to make the place safer, you know, stuff like that. Or we're a family of two and we want a place for, you know, to last us into the years. So we go in, they hand us the keys, you know, we come up with a budget, hand us the keys and then they walk away. So, that level of trust, you know, when we hand those keys back, you know, it's got to be ready for them and it's got to be what they need. You know, that's a big piece of it. And that's, I think, what the, some of the appeal for me of the show is we take a realistic approach and make it what, you know, it's function first. And then if we can do any fun project afterwards, you know, some custom pieces to make it even more special for them. And it seems realistic in terms of, you know, the budget specifically. I mean, a lot of these home shows that you see on HGTV, they've got a $20,000 budget for window treatments. I mean, that's the entire budget for your, for your renovation sometimes. So that's realistic to, I think, a lot of people who are rehabbing their homes or fixing up their, their camps. And, you know, I guess, 
are you really that frugal, or are they? Are you calling me cheap? No, are they forcing your? Are these people forcing your like hand, or, <laughs> or do they go to you because they know you're gonna you're gonna stretch their, or you know you guys are gonna stretch their dollars? Well, I think that's that's just part of it. You know, we want to make these camps. We love going to camp. Everybody loves going to camp. We want to keep that experience going for people to keep people coming back. Anything we can do to stretch that budget makes it that much better. Um, so, I mean, there's that aspect of it, but then there's also the saving, salvaging, reusing piece of it. It's like if it still has life left to it, use it, you know, it doesn't need to be brand new. I mean, yes, we could go out and spend $20,000 on windows for a camp, but we know that's not what people are looking for. You know, if you have a camp, you got to use it, you got to maintain it, otherwise, you know, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. So we just want to help make sure that happens, and we just you know happen to have fun and have a TV camera following us along doing it. The families that have been featured on the show have been main families by and large, and and that seems to be a, a pretty large percentage of people that are either buying camps or rehabbing camps on any number of lakes that we have. But there's also an element of you know somewhat wealthy out of staters that will come in and and buy properties and and do things that. You know, maybe some Mainers wouldn't do or don't have the means to do. I don't know if you ever kind of run into any tension between, you know, Mainers who have been here and are doing the thrifty thing and that are in line with what, with what you guys do, you know, sort of juxtaposed with, you know, some, some of the wealthy people that come in and want to change the dynamic of a, of a, of a different area. Um, not really. I mean, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of Maine, right? You know, you can have a mansion beside a shack and they can hang out and have a barbecue on the 4th of July. It's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong. But you know, our focus is on these small places, so. Um, you know, season one has been uh, out for a while and you're into season two and season two is running now. What changed between season one and season two uh, for you guys? I mean, did you kind of hit your stride uh, at the end of season one? Did it take some time? And are you guys kind of a, a well-oiled machine now, or <laughs> is, that a stri is that a stretch? We're not there yet. <laughs> um, season one was a very steep, steep learning curve. I mean, we finished the first set of camps, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't think we're going to make it through this season, just because it was so, so stressful. Um, but now, I guess, season two, we've learned what to expect and kind of we can see the stress levels coming so we know how to cope with it better. Stress makes for good TV too though. Right? I mean I still yell at my sister <laughs> plenty but we know it's coming so we're like all right I'm not gonna like you tomorrow but then the next day we do. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's if you can you know, pick, I mean, it might be like picking one of your children, but have there been, of the 20 or so episodes that you shot, is there one that really stands out or a couple that stand out or moments of different episodes that stand out? Um, I think one of my personal favorites was the Eaton Island episode up in, where was that one? <laughs> Sullivan, up in Sullivan. Yeah. You know, it was um, Rob and Candy Eaton, yep. and they're just awesome, awesome people. And I mean, it was a beautiful spot down east. You know, you had to boat out to the island, but you got out there and these logs, you could literally reach in and pull out fists of rotten log. I mean, this place had to be saved and there was nothing they, you know, it was just above their abilities. Yeah. So, you know, we got to spend the prime of summer out on our own private little island and they were just super thrilled when it was done. And it just, it was one that we did the, um, Eagle, carved eagle head with some copper from the state house. Yep. You know, it's like stuff like that. Normally, contractors don't get to do. Right. So it's fun to be able to do all these side creative projects. And you know, we're all creative. We're all, you know, good at what we do. So, that I mean, to me, that one was definitely special. Yeah. Um, I think this season you guys worked with the Travis Mills Foundation on a project. Yep. We had Travis uh, do one of these events with um, Bill Nemitz up in Augusta. What was that like? Um, it was a challenge, yeah. you know? I mean, it was definitely not, I mean, Travis is fantastic, super funny guy, but it was not our typical project. 
you know, we, we went into this and we had a set of detailed blueprints, you know, because we had to make it ADA compliant right. and everything. It's like, okay, this is what you need to do. So, you know, luck, it was tough on that side, but if we hadn't helped out, they wouldn't have had that waterfront space to enjoy the retreat. So we're definitely, you know, honored to be able to help with that part of the project. Yeah. And it, it came out fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you had this business before the show started and you still have the business. So what, is, what has changed about your business? Has it gotten easier to get work? Uh, has it gotten harder in some ways? <laughs> <laughs> you have to say no a lot more? I probably should. <laughs> Um, it's a lot more, I mean, when it first started, it was just, you know, Ryan, Ashley, Dixie, Jedi, Lance, and me. And we were, you know, we'd have a few guys come and help us, but we were ultimately responsible for getting all these camps done. And we were just busting it, trying to get them done. But now this year we've hired on some, you know, some more friends, some really good, skilled workers. So... The business is growing that way. We haven't really had time to expand the business outside of the show. You know, we did 16 episodes this season, which was ambitious. You know, we wrapped up two, two Sundays ago, I think. So, yeah, just the scope of how the business is expanding, I think, has been very interesting to see. And what about your personal life. I know you got four kids. I think you just turned 40. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I'll be there this year too. So I'm right there with you. Uh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> so what do you know? What do you know about this business uh, at 40 that you didn't know at 30? Or, or 20? At 30? Or, or 20. Yeah. I don't 25. even think I was thinking about this at 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, family is always number one priority. You know, Season one was, again, a lot more stressful, probably away from home more, which was hard to figure out. But we'd bring family and friends up whenever we could. Um, and this season, I don't know, I've been, it seems to be a little bit easier. You know, mm -hmm. the kids are getting bigger, their demands mm -hmm. are stronger, but they're, they're getting into it. Do they like the show? They do. You have to force them some to of them a little too much. <laughs> um, no, it's like, you know, we were doing something and I kept the kids out of school so we could go film something. I'm like, you guys, this is not normal. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't expect this. Like, but they're, you know, they're cool. They go with the flow. They're kids. And I mean, I've got great kids. Luckily, a very, uh, very supportive wife. And my mother and mother in law live right in Wayne. So I uh, could definitely not do it without them. Was it, was it ever, and maybe Ashley can answer this better than you, I don't know, but was it ever sort of like, do I really want to get into business with my sister? Did you ever have that thing? Go ahead. <laughs> you can be honest in front of all these friends here. <laughs> um, we've, we've always kind of been in business together, you know? Like it was always... Potluck shop. Potluck shop. We had a, you know, my wife and sister had a small antique shop in Hollowell that my father, you know, that he kind of started this whole thing. We'd go out, I mean, when we were little, he'd take us uh, driving around Augusta during pickup week. And he'd drive along, we'd be in the truck, he'd see something, make us jump out, grab it, throw it in the back of the truck. And if we were really good, he'd let us occasionally pick up a stuffed animal on the side of the road. Still got any of that stuff? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But so, you know, we were always working with him from the very beginning. He kind of instilled that whole salvage, you know, reuse, which he learned from his parents. You know, it was just, he was one of 11, so it's just, it's what you did. And, you know, again, that's the main way of thinking, you know, if it still has life, you know, use it. And a lot of that also brings back, you know, on these old camps we're working on, a lot of them, are just basic structures, but they're built well. You know, they use good materials, real main wood, and sure, you know, it could take 10 years. You go out one summer, you build the platform. Next summer, you put up walls, you know, and ultimately your goal is to get a roof on it. And then over the years, as you expand, you throw an addition on the side. 
and then, okay, well, now we need some, bath some facilities. Put an outhouse back there, and then, you know, it just, it works. You go to camp to have fun, you do a little work on it. But, you know, again, it's, you try and, these are small camps we're working on, and they've just been, they just need some TLC that we come in and give to them, and we enjoy it. And what, 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 do, what do people want most out of you when they come to you and they say, well, we're looking to fix up our, our place on this lake or this whatever? What, what, what's the one thing they ask for most? Windows that open? <laughs> <laughs> it's not much to ask. The bar is pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we succeed. <laughs> no, but, I, but you know, I mean, you're out to camp. You want windows that will open to let the air in, that will keep the bugs out. You want to be comfortable, and you know, besides facilities, keep the rain out, keep the bugs out, you know, you don't need much more. Are there parts of Maine that, you know, growing up here, I'm sure you saw a lot of the state and your family saw a lot of the state, but you probably got to see a lot more of it having done this work and certainly done the show. I know they've been up to the county and down east and all, all over the place. Are there parts of Maine that, you know, surprise you, or is all of Maine more or less uh, the same? Well, there's just so many different parts of Maine. You know, I mean, you think, okay, there's the mountains, there's the north, and there's the coast. But we were doing a camp this season on the New Meadows River in Bath. And you go down these long, windy roads, and there's this little community down in a cove that, you know, never knew about. And then you go down the road a little further, there's another one on the next cove. We did a camp in Mount Vernon this season on Desert Pond, which I never knew was there. So, I mean, and that's right, you know, right beside Wayne, right yeah. there. So there's always new places that are surprising us, and each place has its own unique feel, which I think, again, is a big draw to Maine. I think you said that uh, your family has a couple different camps in different parts of the state, and you, you've got your own house. Do you find that, like, that's the last thing you want to do when you go home, is, like, do work on your camps or your house? <laughs> well, luckily, we did one of our family camps this season, yeah. so. Took care of that, but yeah, my house may be a little neglected. <laughs> so you're like everybody else in here. Oh yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> what's um, what's kind of the nicest thing that somebody has said about the show? Um, I know you must get comments from people all over the country that you know watch it, and you know comments will find their way to you guys. What's the nicest thing somebody said that really sort of like surprised you? I think the greatest compliment I get and I think these guys probably agree, is when somebody says, we love your show, we can sit down as a family and watch this show. You know, I mean that, because again, family is so important. You know, we, we sit down, watch shows with our families, and it's just, it's nice to know that we're putting out a product that, you know, is so family oriented that the whole family can sit down, watch it, enjoy it, laugh, you know, appreciate the humor, and see the beauty of it. And what's the wor worst thing somebody has Stop I mean, picking I on Ashley. <laughs> so they, they take Ashley's stuff. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I think the brother-sister dynamic uh, is, is a little bit unique to this show. And you know, you've got Ashley's husband as well. Um, who's another whole dynamic in and of himself, <laughs> as people know. Um, His hair is an own dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> ha has it changed your relationship with those guys? No, if anything, it's made us tighter. I mean, like it, it really has put us through the ringer. And to know that we can put up with this dress, I mean, the tight, tight deadlines, and come out on the other side and, you know, have a finished product that we all can be proud of. I think we've all, it's probably been the hardest year working for all of us. I mean, we have put everything into it to make a good product and hopefully it shows. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned that you really haven't had a ton of time off. I mean, it's pretty much been go, go, go for many, many months. Um, now you got some time off or getting some time off pretty soon, so. Yeah. Is that, is that strange to have time off? Uh, it is. You know what to do with yourself? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> no, I was lying in bed the other night, and it was like 3 in the morning, and normally I'd be awake being like, okay, so we've got this camp, we've got to do this, blah, 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 and just on and on and on. I was lying there, and I was like, 
So when fish swim up the Damascata <laughs> fish ladder, and like just, and I was like, oh, right, this is what it's like to have time off and not have to worry about camps and stuff like that. So it's nice to have a break. Do you ever forget that um, there are cameras following you around? I mean, does you get to a place where there's like this, I, I feel like the first few times you're doing it, you're aware of it all the time. You're like, oh my gosh, this guy's right in my face. There's lights over here, there's this. Do you, how long did it take to get to a, a level of comfort? Or maybe you're not there yet, I don't know. <laughs> um, pretty quick, yeah. you know. You just forget? Mm-hmm. You, you know, they, job to do it's just part of the daily routine. Like when the, so the film crew is here for two days at the beginning, two days in the middle, and two days at the end of each camp. Okay. So this summer, it would be like, we'd start four, we did it kind of in groups of four, mm -hmm. started four camps, came back in the middle, and then the height of the summer, we were finishing four camps, and then we were starting four camps. So, I mean, for one stretch, there was like a month where the film crew was here, and you've got several projects in the works during that month. Oh, yeah. I mean, pieces moving yeah, yeah. everywhere. But you'd show up, you know, first thing you do, strap on your mic belt, and then, you know, you just knew the routine. It just became part of the, part of the daily activities. Yeah. You know, and then occasionally you'd stop and take a moment to look around and be like, this is not, like, this is strange. <laughs> but, then, but then, boom, right back in it, and you get to the point where it's like, if the film crew are not out of the way, they're going to get knocked over, they're going to get a hammer on the head, you know. Has that happened? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you got good liability? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't know who did it, but. <laughs> <laughs> but like, the, they put GoPros on everything, yeah. and Lance's mission has been to destroy a GoPro. You know, they have them in protective cases. They're pretty sturdy. They really are. <laughs> but his goal has been to destroy a GoPro. I don't know if he succeeded or not, but. Time. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was um, an anecdote about an emu, and I didn't ask you about it because I, I didn't want to yes. spoil it. So maybe you can share that. Yes. So last season on the episode where we built a small cabin in the woods for Lance and Lily, we decided as a wedding gift to get Lance and Lily a couple of birds. Um, Lily, his wife, loves birds. Lance hates them. We wanted ostriches. They, they weren't available, so. So you're thinking birds, and that's immediately where your mind goes? To an ostrich? Yes. OK. All right. Yeah, it's Lance. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> Anything we can do to get him back. People get parrots. <laughs> so you know, she's got geese and all this stuff, chickens. And you know, they're her birds. They're Lily's birds. It's so like, perfect. We'll get a couple emus. Um, the film crew tracks him down. We stash him at my house for a few days. And then Lance, th you know, he knows something's coming. He thinks he's on to us. But it was the day of the reveal. It was like 5 in the morning. Ashley's in my driveway with a film crew. And we're loading these two emus into this large dog crate. <laughs> and we're like, we got to sneak him in. Like, try and find a way to get him by Lance. We pull up. We get him down there. And one of them escapes. <laughs> and so it was like a, where utterly, were you when utterly absurd. Where did it, like, is it running down like a road? Well, that's the funny thing about emu. No, it got into the wood. We got him in the pen at the cabin without Lance knowing about it. And then one got out, but they don't travel far. So we could hear it in the woods. It's like 6 in the morning, and we spent a good two hours running through the woods. Where were the cameras for that? Running through the woods trying to catch the emu. They didn't have time to film it. So I, we were doing this running around and I remember just stopping at That's one point. Cold. Yeah, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, why are we doing this? So where so are the emus now? We didn't catch it. Oh, God. So there's one, during the reveal, there was only one emu in the pen. But we didn't know that Lily, his wife, had been secretly researching emus. And she knew that emus should be in pairs. So when they came around for the reveal, like in the episode, like Lance is thoroughly surprised. Like, that's a true surprise. And Lily was excited, but she was like, oh, you know, this is nice. Thanks. But she was a little disappointed because there was only one. And we, but we couldn't tell it was lost in the woods. <laughs> 
So I, was, I, I flat out lied. I'm like, oh, it's at my house. We only wanted one for the cameras. It was way too distracting. So we did the reveal. She was ha after that, she was thrilled. She was like, so excited. Lance was still pretty bitter. <laughs> and then he found out there was one running around in the woods. <laughs> And so went through the reveal, got Lily out of there, and then Lance and I and the film crew, we all spent probably another two hours trying to catch this emu. Got down the last minute, Lance just goes running, dive tackles the thing, <laughs> and we get it, carry it back, and get it back in the pen. And so now Lance and Lily have five emus. <laughs> How did two turn into five? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yes, that was, that, might, that was a low and a high moment for me. <laughs> you know, are there, are there things like that that happen, you know, in the, you, you mentioned when, you know, the, the crews are there for two days and then two days and two days at the end. There's got to be stuff that happens in those time when the cameras aren't there and you're like, oh man, I wish they were here. No. No. <laughs> Boring. It's like, oh, they missed it. <laughs> no, we do pretty good. Well, actually, I do horrible. Ryan and those guys do really good with GoPro and stuff. You know, that's become a big part this season. It's because Adam, our field producer here, lives in Portland. He comes up and tries to catch as much as he can. In between those. In between. Yeah. But every morning, you know, Ryan will be out there doing a journal entry. Um, you know, Dixie, they'll set up time lapses, you know, capture as much as they can. And then something does happen, you know, we have evidence of it. But you know, there's a lot of stuff they miss, yeah. and a lot of stuff that we do that they miss. Some of, it, some of it's on purpose, so. Um, for the people in the audience that uh, can't afford your services, even though you're, you're very frugal, uh, what's like one thing people can do to improve their own cabin or their own camp that they can get the best, best value for, whether it's you know, for resale or just for functionality? Like what's, what's, what's one thing people can do or a couple things people can do? Roof, keep out the water. You know, I guess I keep out water on top and on bottom. You know, is that a major issue in Maine? Absolutely, rot, 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 rot. You know, nine times out of ten, there's going to be rot. So you know, make sure the roof doesn't leak and it sheds water properly. There's not stuff built on built up on the roof, and make sure the leaves around the camp are pulled back. You know, trees aren't encro encroaching too much. I mean, it's a camp. It's kind of you know, it's a uh, I mean, it's not a living being, but it's, a, it's something that needs to breathe and needs to, you know, have air flow through it, you know, to make everything work properly. It keeps the paint on there, you know, keep the moisture out of it from the paint from, stop the paint from chipping and peeling and stuff like that. But for the, I mean, most bang for your buck, uh, a new coat of paint really goes a long ways. Yeah. That sounds pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> but... It's, yeah, there's no, there's, and that's the other thing. It's like, there's no secrets to what we're doing. You know, I mean, there's endless contractors, carpenters across the state doing, you know, as good of, if not better work than us. And, you know, we're all doing the same thing. We just happen to have a television crew following us around. Do they have beards like yours, though? They try. <laughs> <laughs> We, we want to give the audience some time to ask some questions of you, and I think uh, we want to invite the, uh, some of your yeah. castmates up as well. Um, and maybe, they can, maybe they can back up or refute some of the yeah, things you said here tonight. So. You guys want to come up? No, come on up. <laughs> right, hop right up. There are stairs over here. <laughs> you should have had them on that side of the stairs. Okay. Yes. Hey, you I can have the microphone too. Yeah, squish right in there. It's normally where I am. No. <laughs> <laughs> normally it's Chase Ashley Ryan. I want to know why you didn't get a cool nickname like these guys. It's Chase. Chase. Isn't it? Chase. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, Molly, you don't, don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What it is. is it safe for this? Audience? No. I'm just uh, Molly out there has a microphone, so if people got questions um, of of these guys, uh, have at it.
You probably can just shout it. I think we got a microphone somewhere, but we can hear you. So I must admit, I've only seen the show once, and I promise I'll see it more. But the one time I saw it, it was a competition between groups. So it was an award. Two A frames. The yeah, two A frames. Is that only one show? Or? Yes. That's the one that almost <laughs> finished us. Because <laughs> that, that was the first one we started with, and instantly we got divided up into two teams. Right. Production-driven competition, not our request. <laughs> <Got it>. like, <laughs> Coney Augusta, I mean, Coney Gardner. Coney, Coney Gardner. Gardner. <laughs> and two bigger camps Wait, than what we do now. Yeah. Like, those are, those are the first two camps. Those are total major overhauls. Yes. Like, we, we stuffed in. And they could have been, each could have been their own episode, but it was still so new, the production didn't think that one of those A-frames was enough for an episode. And then, you know, by the time we realized that it was too late. It's too much too late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sadie, Gus. <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So was that show legitimately just, the, you know, Jedi and, and uh, hair guy? <laughs> Hey guys! New nickname! Hey guys. <laughs> All right. Two Cardinal boys against the two Coney boys. Was that legitimately just the two of you guys? It is. Two teams of two? Coney Gun. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely Coney Gun and Rivalry. I thought that, that was one of my favorite shows, and I gotta say that uh, you guys at Crespi at the Big Wall, I thought the view was fantastic. Oh, that was, was such a beautiful thing, right? That camp had been neglected for a long time, and I just, I just saw, saw him on Sunday, too, too, and he was up there with his family enjoying it. And they've been using a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a couple hundred followers. Yeah, yeah. in Wyoming. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that, that camp was a great example of that was something anyone could do. We just, we just had the, we had the, we had the manpower and stuff to like cut all the trees back and just go for it. Like, the, the thing, it just needed a lot of love and time. And you could see it. Had good bones. All the camps we have had. I mean, that camp was put yes. on post. Yeah. Remember that? Like, it was, all cedar. It was on Cedar Post. It had been there for 40 years. Whoever did it the first time did it right. You know, It didn't take a lot to get it back. Love the show. You're doing an awesome job, and you're really doing a terrific job representing Maine in such a beautiful way. All your skills. But I do have to ask you two questions. One is, how do you guys make any money to make a living on this? And two, on that camp with the oysters, um, I, I had a hard time understanding why they were doing that. Is that like a marketing tool that an oyster place would use to bring people in to sell their oysters around the country or the world? What? Can you, can you, I mean, it was such a small spot, you made it much bigger by adding the upper part, and it looked fantastic when you finished, as they all do, but, you know, that particular one, I, is there more to the understanding of that oyster spot? Well, yeah, so it's Glidden Point Oyster Farm, and they have a, they're kind of a distributor for all the oyster farms in the area. It's kind of a spot that they can bring like executive chefs in to kind of show them their product. So yes, it's a marketing tool, but it's also a place for people, if they want to come and stay and see how an oyster farm works, you know, they're welcome to stay there and then go and help sort oysters, stuff like that. Um, it, it truly was a storage shack, but because of the location, they didn't want to just tear it down and lose that valuable space because it was so, so such a nice spot and the view was pretty amazing. Had to save the floor. And when, yes. when we were there actually, we just, had, we had just started, it was April vacation, two or three vehicles, one guy from, I remember, never forget, a guy from Texas pulls in, I think Jen and I was there, pulls in with his SUV, coming in hot, the, it's like a, <laughs> it's like a 40 foot cliff, you know, it's low tide, drives in park, like where are the oysters? Like so excited, <laughs> like, but so excited to find out where the Glidden Point Oyster, like, you know, they build a name, like building, yeah. you know, oysters. building building a brand and like having that there now, like people can come there and they, they built a um, retail shop and, yeah. And, and then B&B too. And B&B, &B, yeah, yeah. Airbnb, on BRBO. Yeah, no place to stay. 
get the water view, the, and the, the, the history that the river has for the production of oysters. Yeah. But definitely a commercial aspect behind it. Oh yeah, very much so. And then as far as the budget, first year was tough, but the production also puts, you know, invests in the show as well, whether it's through trade outs from companies, local artists, stuff like that. And that, you know, that brings up a good point is that we work on fixed budgets and we have the freedom to do what we need to get the job done within that budget. So we can go to places like Hammond Lumber, Hancock Lumber, say, hey, we need a flat of some sort of pine material. Like, what do you have available right now that you can give, give us a good deal on? And we'll take that material and stretch it as far as we possibly can. It'll become ceilings, mm -hmm. it'll become floors, it'll become strapping, trim, you trim, name it. Yeah. We'll rip it down and use it for whatever. That, that number, that's pretty much the cash value that the homeowner puts in. Yes. And, and then we get, yes, you know, exactly. we get trade outs and production money. Yep. Salvage materials. I mean, it's, it's about five to ten thousand dollars more than what you see, but they're pretty realistic. Yeah. If you if you see something from, if you watch closely enough, something from one episode will be, <laughs> but a downgrade from one episode is an upgrade to another episode. Yep. You know, we may take a solar system out of an old camp when a new camp's got a new one. Or a sink. Yeah. Or, toilet, or a sink. Or, or toilet. Toilet. definitely toilets. <laughs> one camp <laughs> might not have had a toilet. <laughs> this <laughs> camp had a toilet upgrade. Now this camp yeah. actually yeah. has a toilet. <laughs> It works. It's true. It works. <laughs> one man's trash. <laughs> one man's toilet. <laughs> How do you, if you have an old camp, you're right on the water, so you have a ton of environmental issues and code enforcement issues. Do you go and work with them first? Yes, and, absolutely. And what kind of accommodations can you make? So, I mean, we don't make any accommodations. Whatever the state tells us we can make. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing. We if you have trees that have to come down, but they're close to the water, you can't. Well, that's not but true. You see no. me it's the, not you true. You see me in one of the episodes, and I'm out there measuring them all, because they're, they're so regulated. Yeah. And Chase taught me how to do it. In one of the episodes, what was it? It's, it's a point, point system. Yeah. From the state. I mean, and obviously because we're on TV, we are going to make sure, sure that we are doing everything like by the law, by the books, because we have everybody's taking note and watching us, and they will yeah. let us know. Has that happened? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh shit. Somebody will call in and say you didn't do this on but a specific. They, but they don't realize they that they're not seeing the fact that we're, yeah. you know, doing it. But on the same side, the, the state is approachable. Oh, there's, very a, there's much a whole, so. we, you know, Chase so. and I have gone up to Augusta, gone into the offices. You have to, you have to do a site plan. You have to do drawings. I mean, it, from zero to 25 feet is a very critical point. There's not a lot you can do. You have to prove everything. And it's a value system. From 25 to 50 feet back, it gets a little easier. After 55 feet, yep. just, you know, it gets to a point like you can do what you want. But they are approachable. You just have to like. You have to take notes, chronicalize everything, and lay a plan out. And each town's different. Each town is very town. different. I was going to say, it depends on each Absolutely. town. Absolutely. That's correct. Absolutely. 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 The wonderful co-enforcement Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. That makes I all the difference. No, the yep. Yeah. That's a big, that's a big part of it. that was the local. <laughs> yes. I, I <laughs> yeah. Mills went to the governor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Travis went to the governor. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a great game. He, he's a well worthy <laughs> cause. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, landscaping uh, was a really nice addition to season two. And speaking of Lance, uh, is he on his way down the main turnpike in the commoter <laughs> <laughs> no, he's in the hammock. Over there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, season two was, was even better than season one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a lot of help in season two. Yes. Yeah. Season one was a lot of us. Season two, we're meeting a lot of great main craftsmen and. Yep. But you're seeing awesome. them also in the show. Which is awesome. You see the other guys that are helping us out. And production's really realizing what it's like to work in Maine. 
like they don't uh, they don't have a clue when they come here. It's, that it's not easy in it's January. It's not easy no. in January. Yeah. Yeah. To put a roof on a place. Yeah. Or when we had the coolest temperature. Yes. It's, right. It was, yeah. it was or ten. Or get a bunch of big fans to get rid of the black flies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah they had a, they've had a couple of interesting requests. They wanted to bring in a uh, snowmaker from Sugarloaf to you. cover a yard of one of our latest. Yeah. <laughs> or, just or, to get the snow what about, what about like, the mirrors to melt off Chase's roof? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring in some mirrors to melt some ice on the roof. And no, it's, it probably doesn't work. I didn't hear that one. Yeah, that's oh, that was Kemp's great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's the process of finding these camps? So, um, it started out, it was kind of, you know, we had friends and families that we kind of approached, and then. There were, we scouted a few camps. Season two got easier. You know, we had a few more submissions. Um, people submit an application. You know, first they start, hey, I've got a camp. Submit an application, photos. And then it's got to fit, you know, our criteria and the production criteria, time frame, you know, budget. Is it realistic to get this work done in six to eight weeks? And then also, <coughs> Is it going to be enough of a transformation, a before and after, for the television side of things? So yes, I love all of you. I so <laughs> support every show, um, but you. I must say, Ashley, you are the star. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Yeah, right. Right, right before we came out, Chase actually said, "I wish Ashley was doing this." <laughs> you stole my line. Upside down and made a light fixture out of it, and you designed that eagle, and then you shot up the trash can. I shot the trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase built the whole place. Oh no, we, we all come up with these ideas. It's definitely a team effort. Definitely a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> Says the little brother. Do you have a question over here? Do you have a list of the main artists that you use? I do, and it, um, we are right now in the process. I have a list of them all. Um, we have a guy working on a website for us, um, and they will all be on there like within the next week. Hopefully. Yeah. Within the next week. Yeah. If you're a main artist, reach out to us. Yeah, and exactly what you said. Ashley, um, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, um, yeah uh, we love you, Ashley. Thank you're you. just, you just absolutely <laughs> amaze us every in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I loved you on the boat, pulling the roof off. That was just. <laughs> I can tell you one person that didn't. <laughs> he didn't think it was going to happen. <laughs> it but worked. That it worked. Was, yeah, I just you inspire me from the clams to the to the metal smithing to everything you do. Just Ooh. just oh. keep on doing what you're doing. I love it's it. Fun. I I can tell. I just <laughs> love it. Those touches. I love I love working with all the main artists and craftsmen, and I get to go meet the coolest people in the whole world. Wait, what about us? <laughs> well, yeah, you guys. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I know I need a break from you. <laughs> I love the target too that you set up. Oh, that one was really cool. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I did have a quick question. It looks like um, fireplaces are going the way of the dinosaur in camps in Maine. Is that is that becoming a thing of the past? I think that we take we get rid of them just because um, they're just not up to code. If and I think I've noticed that everybody's using. They all want um, the cook stoves this year. If you watch the season. Or inserts. Like propane inserts, something, something to provide heat with less maintenance. More efficient. Yeah. Safety. Easier and safety, definitely. But a lot of fireplaces just, they can either be an anchor. Most of the time they're an anchor. They either bring the camp down or the camp shifts around it and they crack. Bit off. And everyone we took out this year, as soon as they got rid of it, the camp went, <laughs> How many? We had three, yeah. right? And they went, and they, Yeah, and they aren't efficient. I mean, they're beautiful, but... We took at least four or five chimneys down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you did. Sorry. You did. Dixie and Brad. <laughs> Dixie and Brad. <laughs> One question. Yeah. Um, here's my question. 
I have been going to camps like this for like 60 years at, with my, you know, my friends, families of friends, and they all look like, oh my God, tear it down. So, and when I watch your show, I think, oh my God, they're going to renovate this? <laughs> tear it down. <laughs> and so I want to know from you, because I am really and truly in awe of your design skills and the synergy that you bring and the enthusiasm that you bring to the project for saving these camps. Have you ever found one that you said, oh God, can't do it, tear it down? <laughs> I, I've tried, but he won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, you um, look at Ron, stuff that's no. rotting, and Tell have you ever seen one that just, game. you didn't think it should be saved? Um, again, it's, they were built with good material, and it really can withstand the test of time. I mean, you know, to replace a rotten beam, if it's, if it's solid wood, you know, you can get a new hemlock beam, slide in there very easily. So, and you know, that's one of the things we look for when we scout camps is, okay, is it, you know, are the bones, are the bones good? Right. So. And the family memories will never be the same once you tear it down. Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. You, 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 you can you never replace that. purse out of the sow's ear, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> We're saving memories. A lot of them should be torn down, but people are saving memories. You know, and you can't yeah. put a price on that. Third generation, second generation, yeah. you know, yeah. multi generation. Or recently camps. purchased. Or recent, you know? recently purchased. But then, you know, I think Broad Hills is probably the. I mean, that thing. We could, I, that we could have probably been ran through it. it and it, it was one of the best reveals, transformations. It, it came, it came back together. to life. The schoolhouse, too. Was yeah, 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 that yeah, that was yeah the schoolhouse. Yeah. It's exciting to watch them come back. I mean, that's one of the really so exciting, exciting things about watching the show is what you, what you do with it and how you can... Well, see, we, we're we there every day. That. We forget. Yeah, we don't get to see it. And I think every single reveal this season, I was still nervous to hand it back over. If they like it. Yeah, just nervous to make sure they were going to like it. And Knock on wood, luckily. We <laughs> Two weekends ago, Ryan was willing to trade the Patriots victory for a, yeah. for a, homeowner, a homeowner's reveal. And for a minute, I thought I screwed New England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, it, the Patriots and the reveal were on the same day, and it was a, it was a nerve wracking day. I did day. say I, I, would, I, would give, I would give a Patriots loss for a homeowner <laughs> victory. <laughs> Which is huge for him. Which is huge for him. <laughs> and I agreed with him. When I come, I'm like, yes, we are hours away from this homeowner reveal. The Patriots play in a few more hours. Like, what do we want here? What and that was the last game of the year. Yeah. Still, do you never not like? Yeah. It was two victories, thank what Lord. Do you guys thank you the Lord, it was two there. victories. <laughs> Jason are the ones that have to be there to like. Yeah, but it's still pride. You want to yeah. know, like, you want I them know, to be happy. Like, Keeping these camp owners happy is, yeah. is we got a question over here. ultimately. That's a great point. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if uh, you guys had any thoughts on tiny houses, now that there seems to be a groundswell in Maine, and also if you considered other sort of upcycling uh, in terms of like shipping container cabins, if you've seen anything like that, or if you guys have any thoughts on ways that could be incorporated into the camp tradition. We're also love the show, thanks. Well, the one thing we stress is that a camp in Maine means many things. A camp to someone on the coast can be a million dollar house, and a camp up north can be a five thousand dollar hunting shack. But the same thing happens at camp for the same families. You know, memories. It's camp, and you know, and like yeah, you, you, we would love to take it. Were we trying to get Jenna to do something? <laughs> houseboat. My, houseboat. Yeah, my, oh. ne my next move is going to be my houseboat, and that's going to be an episode. We're hopefully, season Maine. three. <laughs> but like, but like, ship, a shipping container make a great camp. Yeah. You know, we're open to anything really. No, not <laughs> no, you, you We're open to you, most You could do some very, very cool things. We could do some very... We could do some very cool things. You know, cool a tiny things. house is considered uh, anywhere from 900 to 500 square feet. And, you know, a lot of the camps we've done this year have been in excess of that. So, yeah. I mean, we haven't really touched on the tiny house. Good Point was right on that. Yeah, that, that was right yeah. there. Yeah. The That's oyster tiny. strap was about a tiny house. We'll that do 20 of those well. episodes. <laughs> you a question about it? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, it looks like in all of the uh, camps that you've done, the owner hands you the keys 
they're out of the picture and they never have any interaction with you until the end? Is that always the case? Um, no. 80%. 80% of them. I mean, most camp owners, yes, hand us the keys and walk away. A lot of them are grateful. You know, after they're done, they're like, thank you. We didn't have to make one decision about paint colors, anything like that. We come back and it's done for us. Um, it takes a certain personality to be able to be on the show. Um, you know, I think people, yeah, it's, it's not for everybody. But there was a couple camps where it was a work, like the working water, like the oyster camp. Yeah. He might have, they were close, you know, but, but, but they, they but they leave us alone. Like, yeah, he would. The, um, the Daggett camp. Tom, that, uh, Tom, Tom was there, was there. every day. Some, home, some owners refuse, and they just <laughs> and a lot of times are there. We have the discussion. Do you think they checked it out? Like, have they been around? Have they been snooping? Oh, so yeah. it goes both ways. They totally sure. have. Like, but most of them like they want stay, to be surprised. They stay right. away. The majority of them stay away from the projects. Yeah. Like someone be like, oh, I was down at, I was down at the country store, and so and so wanted to tell me, and Mrs. Brown wanted yeah, to tell yeah. me about this. Like, I don't want to hear it. Like, <laughs> they want to be surprised. Yeah. You know, they want to know. But we're in contact with them throughout the process. We're just not telling them anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> another question in the back? Is the, um, is the program uh, broadcast nationally? Yes. Yes. Okay. I globally. It's globally. We've heard about Australia. Jamaica. Jamaica. Okay. I got a message from uh, somebody in Jamaica yesterday Europe. that was uh, just tuned in, absolutely loving it. A friend of mine was uh, vacationing in Iceland. And uh, she saw a commercial for the show on a London network. <laughs> so, I don't think that uh, that's us. That's just American TV. It's everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it's us. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Dr. So, did you ever in your wildest dreams think the show would be so successful? Because I absolutely love it, and I wouldn't miss an episode. Never. <laughs> and that's not true. We thought the show would be successful. No, I never. When you when you came up on the roof, <laughs> we never thought that we you, would be. We were on a you, roof in January you, you when Chase came. Like, and it's like, it's like, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Get the hell off the roof. <laughs> Snowing right now. If there's a second to go home today, show I'll be on TV. <laughs> no, I never thought. The Skype interviews definitely made it a, a kind of a reality. Yeah. So I'm sure. guessing there's an episode, there's going to be a third season? We're, we hope so. We hope so. Oh, so. Uh, we hope so. <laughs> 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 Anybody else? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah. If nobody's got any more questions, uh, yeah, right, we're I down here. I just a friend of mine who's connected with the uh, guy that had the Kimball Pond place done. Yeah. And through Facebook, they have shown that they're they have got it. That guy had done some more changes after you guys left. Does that happen a lot that you hear yes. that they, people will come in after you finish? And Definitely. It inspires yes. them. Yeah. But we, again, we're also working on very small budgets. You know, we'll get a, like, a camp to a point and then let the homeowner come in and finish it at their, at their discretion, you know. We didn't connect wood stoves in that one just because they may want it. Certain things they may want arranged differently than we would necessarily arrange it for television. So when it comes to like putting in a wood stove, putting a hole through the roof, stuff like that, you know, we wouldn't do that so that they can kind of place it where they want it to be. Again, make it more functional for them how they want it. But for the most part, it's we bring it to a usable blank canvas, yeah. a blank canvas for them to know that it's going to be dry, it's going to be solid, and it's going to last. So all your, all your chase stuff, all your repurposing stuff, was that your dad's? Yes. That was my grandfather and my grandmother as well. I mean, generations. Uh, yeah. I've chase, got... I'd like to give you a quote from my dad. We would take the dump yeah. on certain days, and my father, someone in town said something to him one day, and he got puffed up and he said, I, I proudly come from a long line of dump pickers. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> All the stories we could share. <laughs> I think these guys are probably going to hang out if you want to introduce yourselves. Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank Chase and Ashley, Ryan. I don't even know if I know your names. Jared and Matt. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> those are the yellow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and thank you guys for coming out, especially on a cold night in January. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.